Um, the Cochrane Collaboration is a huge international group that was created just to do what are sort of imbiased, unbiased assessments of the medical literature. And as they put it, weight loss achieved in trials of calorie restricted diets is so small as to be clinically insignificant. It doesn't work. And it's funny, back in the 1957, the woman named Hilda Brook, who was then the leading expert on pediatric childhood obesity in the U.S., said, you should never expect it to work. And the way she put it this way, she said, more than in any other illness, a physician treating the obese patient is called upon only to do a special trick to make the patient do something, stop eating, after it has already been proved that he could not do it. If he could have stopped eating, he wouldn't have been fat. And you could actually, there was another German authority who said, we could define obesity as for those people for whom eating less didn't work. Um, exercising more also doesn't work. Um, this is, uh, you know, lately we, tell, we want to blame everything on sedentary behavior. All these diseases that I talked about, obesity, diabetes, um, they're all now considered diseases of sedentary behavior because the doctors accept that eating less doesn't work. So they figure maybe, and a lot of lean people get these diseases, so maybe all the people get these diseases are sedentary. And in which case exercising more should cure the problem, and it doesn't. Okay, and I could again cite you meta-analyses and reviews, but I find this more compelling. This is, in 2007, the American Heart Association and the American College of Sports Medicine put together their physical activity guidelines. And what they said, and these are people who want us to exercise every day. They think exercise is a critical part of a healthy lifestyle, as do I, as does Grant, obviously, since he sells bikes for a living. Um, but the question is, if you increase your exercise, is that going to help you lose weight? you increase the energy you expend every day. And this is what they said. They said, it's reasonable to assume that persons with relatively high daily energy expenditures would be less likely to gain weight over time compared with those who have low energy expenditures. That's like saying it's reasonable to assume that people who run marathons every day would be less likely to gain weight over time than people who are couch potatoes. Or people who are couch potatoes, this is logically equivalent. If you're a couch potato and you decide to become a marathon runner, you're less likely to gain weight over time. And to that they said, so far data to support this hypothesis are not particularly compelling. And the interesting thing is, this hypothesis is 150 years old, okay, at least. Um, well, I'm going to say it's at least 120 years old and possibly 150 years older. And the interesting thing about it is if you have a hypothesis in science, what you do is test it. And the idea is if you test it, then you accumulate data to support it. And after a while, you say the evidence supporting my hypothesis is compelling. If the best you could say about a 150-year-old hypothesis is that the data to support it are not particularly compelling, what it tells you is that the hypothesis is probably wrong. Okay? It is probably not true that you could just lose weight by increasing your energy expenditure or the you know, people who have been throwing money at this problem for decades would have shown, you know, come up with better evidence. So here's another problem. Practicing energy balance is impossible. How many of you have heard this phrase that you got to be, you know, you got to practice energy balance. You have to match your calories in to calories out, okay? That's what we're supposed to do. That's why we count calories so that we could match the calories into the calories out and not get fatter. And you could ask the question, how well do I have to do that to make sure that I don't get fat? I want to make sure, like right now I'm, well I'm not, but if you're in your 20s and you're lean, and you want to make sure that you're still lean in your 40s, so you don't want to gain, say, 20 pounds a decade, because if you gain 40 pounds in 20 years, you'll be obese by the time you're in your 40s, which happens to a lot of us. How accurately do you have to count calories? And this is the exercise we're going to go through, okay? A typical American's food intake is around 2,700 calories a day. That's average for men and women. That's about a million calories a year or 10 million calories in a decade. It's about 10 tons of food. So now you want to make sure that you don't gain 20 pounds over the course of the decade. You don't, you know, overshoot your, your point of energy balance. And how closely do you have to monitor and you have to match your calories out to calories in better than 20 calories a day. If you take one bite extra of food every day and it gets into your fat tissue without being burned, 20 calories a day, you will gain 20 pounds in a decade or 40 pounds in two decades. You'll go from being lean to obese. Here's 
the calculation. It's very simple. 20 calories a day times 365 days in a year times 10 years divided by 3,500 calories, which is the number of calories in a pound of fat, and you end up with 21 pounds per decade. And that's, so you've got to basically, you've got to count match calories into calories out to 0.8% accuracy. And the point of this is that nobody can do that. No human being can do that. Even if there's somebody out there who's in the Guinness Book of World Records for being able to count the calories they consume, they have really no idea how many calories they're expending. So one of the ideas here to get around this problem is you think, well, you know, when Michael Pollan, for instance, tells us to eat not too much or people say just, you know, make sure you always walk away hungry or leave some of your food on the plate, and the idea is that you should always undershoot. So at least you won't overshoot by 20 calories a day. But in that case, the math works both ways. The question is, why don't everybody end up looking emaciated? And the point of this exercise, I first read this in a 1937 metabolism textbook written by the leading expert in metabolism and nutrition in the United States. And he said, considering this number, this 20 calories a day thing, there's no stranger phenomena than the maintenance of a constant body weight under marked variation in bodily activity and food consumption. Many of us do maintain our weights for years on end. And how do we do it? Because we're not counting calories to within you know, one bite of food, one apple, two sips of Coca-Cola. Um, and if you think, well, maybe we're doing it just by as our weight, you, know, you start to get fatter and your belt gets tight. Or you look in the mirror and you go, hey, I'm looking a little jolly. So now you undershoot consciously for a few years. But then you have to ask the question, how do animals do it? Because they don't wear belts or look in mirrors. And so how do they maintain their weights? And they're obviously not matching calories into calories out, because nobody can do that. That's impossible. And that's what this fellow Eugene Dubois said, the uh, father of nutrition research. He said, considering this number, the question isn't, why do some of us get fat? The question should be, why aren't all of us fat? Because if this is how we're supposed to stay lean, we should all be obese. So here's a, I'm going to get, I'm going to actually show some photos of naked human beings for which I apologize. Um, if you were to read obesity textbooks over the last 10, 20 years, you will never see photos of naked human beings. But prior to the Second World War, European researchers studying obesity believed that you could learn a lot, not just from whether or not someone's fat, but how people get fat how they distribute fat on the human body. So all these photos are taken from pre-World War II textbooks. And basically what I'm doing now is channeling how the pre-World War II European researchers thought about obesity, because they had an entirely different theory than we did, which is interesting. They didn't think, they thought it was crazy to think it's all about calories in, calories out. And they actually pioneered all the fields of research that were relevant to obesity endocrinology, which is the science of hormones, genetics, metabolism, nutrition. Um, prior to the Second World War, all meaningful science was done in Europe. Okay, actually, when I was writing about physics, my first career, the physicists used to say, the best thing that ever happened to American science was Hitler, because he drove all these brilliant Europeans over to the United States. And in physics, we embraced them, because we had uh, atomic bombs to build, and then a Cold War with the Russians to fight. And if you look at the major figures in physics in the middle of the 20th century, they're all European emigres. And then after that, it was all the students of these European emigres. But in medicine and public health, we didn't embrace them. In fact, after the war, the young war vets in medicine and nutrition wanted nothing to do with the Germans. They rightfully hated them. And so they didn't even read this literature. And they reinvented obesity. And this idea of calories in, calories out was their reinvention of something that seemed obvious to them. So let's get back. Here's how the Europeans thought about it. I'm just going to channel them for a while. The first thing they asked, you know, obesity has a huge genetic component. It runs in families. And we know this identical twins not only have the same faces, they have the same bodies. And so on the left here, your left, there's a lean pair of identical twins, and on the right is an obese pair of identical twins. And we could imagine that our overeating hypothesis, our calories in over calories out, could explain why the obese pair is fat and the lean pair is thin. But what it can't explain is why the lean pair have the exact same body and the obese pair have the exact same body. Like, did the lean pair, did the genes determine how well they counted calories so that that pair could, could count calories every day to within, like, say, two calories excess? And the obese pair not only couldn't do it, but it determined exactly how badly they did it. 
so, or, you know, how many hours a day they sat on the couch and how many hours a day the lean pair, you know. It doesn't really make any sense. We start losing, the whole idea starts to fall apart if we want to know why bodies can end up looking alike because of their genes. And here's another way to think about it, animal husbandry, okay. For hundreds of years, farmers, ranchers have been breeding cattle to be pigs, sheep to be lean or fat, depending on taste. So on the left there is a lean breed of cow. It's a Jersey cow. It's a dairy cattle. You could see the swollen udder. And on the right here is Aberdeen Angus, which is a meat cow. And you could see the meat in the picture with all the fat. So the lean cow, you know, you could see the ribs. That's how little fat it has. And this, this Aberdeen Angus is stocky and muscular and fat. And the question you want to ask yourself is, since these are different breeds of cows, we know it's genes. What are the genes controlling that determine how much fat is accumulated on these animals? Are they controlling calories in and calories out? Like, do they control how many bites the animal grazes every day? Like, the, you know, the Jersey cow takes 2,307 bites, and the Aberdeen Angus takes 2,512, or they take more calories per bite, or the Jersey cow you know, uh, uh, grazes for 10 hours and the Aberdeen Angus goes for 12 or maybe the Jersey cow. Remember the Far Side cartoon where he like goes for a jog, she goes for a jog every evening after the, you know, when the cars aren't around, this guy wanders into the barn and watches television. Um, I mean, it's obviously whatever, you know, it's pretty clear when you look at animals, whatever those genes are controlling for, it has nothing to do with how much they exercise or how much food they take in. And you could probably imagine that what it has to do with is how they use the fuel they do consume. So for the dairy cow on the left, you could see the swollen otter, basically speaking brutally. Um, you know, you've got a machine that takes in calories on one side and turns it into milk. And you don't want that, you want this machine to be as efficient as possible, so you don't want it, uh, those calories going to fat and muscle and all this, you just want it transformed into milk. And this guy, girl, on the right, you want it transformed into meat and fat and protein. So maybe the genes control how these animals, what's called partition, the fuels they use. Whether they send it over to the udders to be turned into milk, or whether they send it into the meat, you know, into the body to be turned into fat and protein. 